I will read the Ursula Le Guin version. Daring to do. Brave daring leads to death. Brave caution leads to life. The choice can be the right one or the wrong one. Who will interpret the judgment of heaven? Even the wise soul finds it hard. The way of heaven doesn't compete, yet wins handedly. Doesn't speak, yet answers fully. Doesn't summon, yet it attracts. It acts perfectly, perfectly easily. The net of heaven is vast, vast, wide meshed, and yet misses nothing. Okay. So, oh, as I just saw Evanique. Followed by David, then Brian. Okay, uh, chapter 73. This is from the Tao of Christ. Um, courage untempered leads to death. Courage within caution, with caution leads to life. These two qualities, courage and caution, can be either good or bad. It takes wisdom to know when and how to be courageous. God does not argue, yet always wins. God does not use words, yet always communicates. God does not coerce, yet people come to God. God's nets are vast and their mesh wide, but they lose nothing. So I'll present the uh, Lao translation. He who is fearless is being bold will meet with his death. He who is fearless in being timid will stay alive. Of the two, one leads to good, the others to harm. Heaven hates what it hates. Who knows the reason why? Therefore, even the sage treats some things as difficult. The way of heaven excels in overcoming, though it does not contend, in responding, though it does not speak and attracting, though it does not summon, and laying plans, though it appears slack. The net of heaven is cast wide, though the mesh is not fine, yet nothing ever slips through. Enjoy your unmute. Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Brian, followed by uh, Penny. Okay, I'm reading from the book by Yasuhiko Kimura. Courage in daring action will lead to death. Courage in caring action will lead to life. Of these two, one is beneficial and the other harmful. Heaven does not favor harmful courage yet there are few who really know the reason. Thus the sage does not make light of this truth. He who abides by the way of heaven triumphs without fighting, responds without chattering, reaches out without being asked, plans ahead without being impetuous. Though its meshes may appear wide through the vast net of heavenly law, nothing can ever slip. I really like that translation. Um, next up is Penny. Okay, this is uh, J.H. McDonald. Being overly bold and confident is deadly. The wise use of caution will keep you alive. One is the way to death and the other is the way to preserve your life. Who can understand the workings of heaven? The Tao of the universe does not compete, yet wins. Does not speak, yet responds. Does not command, yet is obeyed. And does act, but is good at directing. The net of heaven are wide. The nets of heaven are wide, but nothing escapes its grasp. Uh, thank you, Penny. Um, does 
anyone else wish to read their favorite version of verse 73? If not, uh, we will go over to Jason. Mar Margarita, you don't, did, if, I don't know if you were able to find the passage, but I know we usually enjoy yeah. reading. I'm reading it, but uh, it has different meaning because it puts God and, yeah, words about God and what God wants. So I'm not sure this is the right one this time. Maybe I skip after I, I understand Jason's translation, perhaps. Okay, that's quite all right. <laughs> all right, that works out well. Um, all right, Jason. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, sorry. So I think this one, 73 and the 74, I think the, you probably can feel the tone is different, kind of like a lot of curry. So let's start from this one, uh, heaven's net. Okay, so he, uh, valiant enough to dare, means to venture, would be killed. He, uh, valiant enough to dare, to dare not, or leave. Okay, so two kinds of theory. So these two types of theory can be beneficial or harmful. Who knows the reason one is detested by heaven? For this reason, even the sage treats it as difficult. So if we remember on the chapter 63, we talk about treats things difficult, everything will be easy. I think that's related. The Tao of heaven, <clears throat> without buying, yet excels at winning. Without speaking, yet excels at responding without summoning yet arrive spontaneously, is at ease yet excel at uh, strategizing. Heaven's net is vast. It is a sparse mesh, but nothing can slip through it. I think the last uh, stanza, heaven's net is vast. It is sparse mesh, but nothing can slip through it become a saying, common saying, used in the legal or law, okay? Basics used as a warning in today's language, uh, as a warning sign, like you don't see, don't take chance, you know, because the heaven's net has been considered as the law, okay? The criminal law, okay? The law is not in detail, they have a lot of loophole, it's vast. Okay, it's uh, the, like, think about the law, it's a sparse mesh, but you have no chance to escape it. Okay, so in today's Chinese saying, the last stanza become kind of different than um, this original text, but it has a source from this, from this chapter. And we might want to think about what this chapter uh, in the Taoism meaning. I think that means the, Tao, the Tao of heaven, right? The Tao of heaven is not buying, not speaking, not summoning, okay? And it, it's easy, okay? But everything will be done. So kind of that, like another thing, remember we talk about two themes. One is Wu Wei, non-action. Another thing is not buying. And someone want to suggest us not uh, striving, okay? So this one is Tao and achieve. So eventually we talk about the Tao, doesn't look like have detail everything, but it's a huge sparse mesh, but nothing can escape or from uh, through the Tao or nothing can, uh, uh, it, it, it's a sparse mesh, but you know, it cover everything. Okay, I think that's the original meaning. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Anjay, uh, Jason. Aman, would you like to comment? Um, I'm always delighted to get to see the final product along with everyone else when Jason puts it up. But it, it's a great translation. I think he did a wonderful job. Um, it's a fascinating passage because it really 
is sort of a synthesis package or passage, excuse me. Um, if you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, let me turn my brain a little bit up in volume. If you look at the first half where it talks about being brave enough to venture versus being um, being hated by uh, these two kinds of bravery. And then it, it talks about why heaven detests one. For this reason, the sages still treat it as difficult. That whole first passage is first about duh or virtues that a person may have, but it then moves into a discussion about the Tao and that transition. Why does heaven treat this one so detestably? Even the sages can't say. Um, is then again a lead in to what is the nature of the Tao. And when it talks about the Tao of heaven or heaven's net, really it's talking in both capacities about the greater Tao. That, that's what it's implicating. Um, if you kind of game this passage out, I found uh, Yasuhiko's translation that Brian read fascinating because there's a line that he said, uh, the sage don't treat it lightly. And I think there is a, an attempt at humor in this passage on Lao Tzu's part, because he's talking about the, <clears throat> the foolhardy brave who are basically rushing headlong into death. And I'm sure that at the time in ancient China, there would be numerous experiences of somebody who had a great idea, you know, and wound up, you know, becoming a, a winner of the uh, gene pool editing award as a result. And so they'd seen this sort of fool's rush in behavior before and asking the teacher, why did that person just, you know, get blown away by the hurricane when they were out there shouting at it. And, and the teacher has to look at him and says, the Tao just hates some people and we can't exactly say why. It, it, it's a mystery, even to us sages. That is kind of a little tongue in cheek on Lao Tzu's part about the fate of the brave who dare to venture. Um, and then going on to explain a bit more, it seems in contrast with that passage that talks about the Tao has no preferences, treats all as straw dogs. But we see in the world around us where those who are truly foolhardy, the, the truly um, incautious, how their own exploits have a way of blowback. A and it, you know, we could say it's karma, we could, we could put whatever title we want on it, but it's still sort of the same idea here. You want to, you know, rush out and battle the hurricane, fine. Do it the smart way by battening down the hatches months in advance and securing your, your kingdom, secure your home, secure your buildings, and then you can just wait it out. If you get out there and start hammering or start, you know, waving fans at the blowing winds, you may be brave, but you are not long for continued existence on, with the human race. Thank you, Iman. Um, I, you know, the, some very interesting things and very interesting comments by both you and Jason. Uh, I will withhold any comments at this moment, but uh, I really, Oh, uh, Madeline, please. Yes, um, thank you, Jason and Mon. This is a lovely one. I have a question. Uh, it's about the word net. I seem to remember that in a in one of the other verses, uh, there was a word. I think it meant straight. It meant straight or something like that. Um, and it contained the word net, or it it had the meaning of. Um, the vertical sticks that hold a net up. And I'm wondering if the two words are related in some way. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone else remember that discussion of that character? I remember the discussion, but I'm 
looking for the passage as we speak because it's evading me. Thank you. Do, do you know the chapter? Which chapter? I don't. No, I only remember uh, the, dis <laughs> the discussion about the character with Net in it. With Net? First Net? Uh, it, it was uh, a character, it meant something like straight or vertical. And um, and it contained, it had the connotation of a, of a net, like the kind of net where you have vertical sticks in it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, let me, that's a difficult word. Okay, uh, I don't, let me think about which chapter. Yeah, they talk about the birds, uh, birds uh, feather, okay, going to follow the birds feather, that's the word. Okay, I, I don't see the, if that's the one, I don't see the relation on that, but uh, that's, I, I assume that's the one. I, I can find the chapter. I, and I, I need to, to, to check. Oh, that, that's okay. I didn't mean to derail everything. I just uh, just thought of it. Uh, it was the, I think it was that's, the other time the topic of net came up. That's chapter 49 that you're remembering, Jason, but I don't think that's the one that Madeline's referring to. Give me a I'm still. Well, um, does anybody else wish to comment? If not, I mean, I, I can just uh, make a quick comment uh, just uh, briefly. Uh, on um, the reason I actually liked the Asahika version in this particular instance was he used the word courage instead of uh, instead of uh, bravery, uh, which is actually was a little bit different than than most of the translations that I'd come across. Uh, and the reason I liked the word courage to be used is to coming back to Amon's point was this idea of not rushing into uh, to risk yourself full heartedly. And the reason why, and if you do, you, in order to have courage, you need to have wisdom because you have to actually know that there's a risk involved in what you're taking. So I need to actually, uh, for, for me to know that there's a, a chance of death and that this death is actually worthwhile and it's the, it's the wise thing to do, it's wise action. And that I'm not just, you know, just uh, being uh, haphazard and and acting foolishly with my and disregarding all risk. Well, then that takes an act of courage. So I really, I, that's the reason why I the Yasuhiko version actually spoke to me in this particular instance. Um, and I think that that's uh, was that something along the lines that you were kind of uh, where you were going with that um, Amon with some of your comments. Um, yeah, kind of. The, there's two words at play in this chapter, and you all have to forgive me. I'm actually even more tired than I normally am. Um, so it's been quite a day. But um, it's the words that uh, Jason translated as, ah, here we go. Yong and Gan, which We've talked about one before, but I'm gonna put these in the chat for everyone to see. Um, Gan is to dare. We've talked about that before. Yong is, he translated as valiant. And valiant, courageous, both could be apt translations of this term. But when you put them together, is it just a redundancy? And here, I don't think that's the case. I think Jung is being used as the adjective, the description of the, what the person's character is. And Gan is being used more as a verb describing, which is why the parentheticals daring to venture, I think make a lot of sense in this passage because the syntax may be the same, but the semantics are slightly different. Um, so together you have this idea of being brave to dare. Well, in English sounds very redundant, but here it has this idea of having the character to take action. 
which we usually think of as a positive thing by itself. But once again, in true Tao Te Ching fashion, it's spun 180 degrees to say, yeah, this may look good on, on its face, but really it's a recipe for disaster. That, that person who is brave enough, courageous enough to dare for it, it is not going to be, you know, the Achilles of this, this tale. They're, they're more likely than not going to be the first one to take an arrow to the face. And, you know, planning ahead, thinking in terms of maybe making the unpopular decisions in advance so that you don't have to be that person when the time comes. That's where real virtue is, can be found. Excellent comments, especially considering you're pretty fatigued. I appreciate that. Um, Jason. Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that, I think this one is uh, kind of Lao Tzu play around the, uh, the sentence, okay, like uh, Aman put in the chat, Yong Dao, okay, that's uh, today's uh, Chinese language, okay, it's been used for a long time, okay, that's a redundant word, just like uh, Aman said, but if you look through the meaning of these two words. The first yong, okay, means bravery. That means your personal quality. Okay? And that like brave or valiant, okay? It can be used as an adjective or not. Basically talking about the person, your quality, okay? Your uh, disposition. Uh, the second word, gan, it has been used very often is means dare or means your action, right? Are you willing to do this? So, yong gan, these words, as a, uh, 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 combined together, sounds redundant, but basically talk about you have this kind of person, per personality, and you are willing to do something. Okay, so right now, Lao Tzu is playing the game here. He said, yong, you have this person, personality, and you willing to do something. You may face death, death, right? You may go into danger. But if you have this personal personality as a bravery, but you dare not doing something, then you will survive. So you think about the situation. We not necessarily doing the right thing if we go forward active do something, right? For example, uh, uh, let's say you see the uh, hurricane coming, right? So you see some danger, you may run out to save somebody, but sometimes you forget, you probably have more people inside the house. If you go outside, you probably make yourself killed and you don't help at all. So at that time, you probably have to hold it. That's another kind of bravery, right? Because you have no chance to survive. Yeah, I, this one sounds like totally utilitarian, okay, like totally uh, dilemma. Right. This time. But we can use this one as an example, right? Sometimes you hold it, not doing things. Or sometimes it during the war, uh, you know it's dangerous, you want to kill the enemy. But for some reason, for some greater purpose, you hold it, okay? You see the enemy there, you hold it, you're not going to kill or let them pass. Okay, because you have a higher purpose. I think that's another way to say. So, so here is yong and the gan. Usually put the yong and the gan, but Lao Tzu is talking about yong and the not gan. Okay, it's also a good thing. I think that's the way. Uh, and then we will see, uh, I think we have seen a lot of th this kind of example in the Tao Te Ching. Thank you very much, Jason, for that explanation. Uh, next up, we have Margarita. Yes, I, I think now I get it why in Bahasa Indonesia translation, they translate it into gods, what gods want, what gods hate, maybe because they translate it from the heaven, heaven into gods. If I may, I want to read in Bahasa and I, I uh, can please. I do that? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes, so, uh, Tao tidak berebut tapi menang. Gagah berani menuju kematian. 
gagah disertai kewaspadaan menuju hidup. Dua macam kegagahan ini, sorry, am I reading the right thing? Oke, okay. berani untuk gagah menuju kematian. Berani untuk tidak gagah disertai kewaspadaan menuju hidup. Dua macam keberanian ini, satu memberi faedah dan yang lain bencana. Manakah yang berkenan bagi langit? Maka orang bijak tidak menganggap enteng. Hukum langit tahu tanpa menyerang dapat menang. Tanpa bicara tetap merespon. Tanpa menyuruh hadir tetap datang dengan sendirinya. Tenang tapi bisa menyelesaikan masalah. Jaring alam luas, renggang tapi tak ada yang lepas darinya. What I think I get from the Bahasa one, it's more about not take, to take things lightly. Uh, it's better to be alert before making decision what to do because the the nature's doubt. The, it's quite interesting why they use law this time. The law of the nature, according to Tao, it's it's not easy to be understood. That's why you need to take alertness before making decision. So daring is not something that we should do just strike that, but we need to be uh, alert, not 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 to easily uh, be tempted into doing something. Yeah, that's what I get from Bahasa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Uh, Jason, good please. Yes, uh, it, uh, uh, Margarita, I think the Bahasa the person who trains the Bahasa probably know Chinese, right? That's why he put the law over there, okay? So because in this in this text, original definitely has no law, okay? In, in this text, but in Chinese, people talk about for the last standard, okay, the, 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 the heaven's net is best. It's a sparse mesh, but nothing can slip through it. Uh, Chinese use this one to describe the law. And I believe the Bahasa translator, uh, he know, he or she happened to know Chinese. So we reflect as a law here. So. But the thing is, Jason, it, they also connect the law and God. I don't get it why God suddenly appear here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm it's not, not sure. A divinity, is it a, it's not a divinity type of God. Is that uh, it is a divinity. Uh, the law from the God will not will not wrestle, but it will be uh, perfect and it will win. Something like that. <laughs> That's why I kind of also the uh, Islamic thinking through the divine law, but I don't no. see Chinese has a concept of divine divine law. You know, but, but anyway, uh, no, maybe not from uh, from Islam uh, because this is. But in Indonesia, there is religion of Tao. So Tao priests, yeah, I'm not. So sure. that that would make sense, right? Is that correct? Or let, let's let Aman make a comment. Um, I was just going to say, I, I think the, I think the translation attempts to take a idea out of context and place it into a context where it would be more familiar because, um, Tao as a religion in Indonesia is much more divinity based. There are a lot of gods within the Taoist religion. Um, and that is more how the common people would would interact or engage with it and i i hate to say it as sort of pejorative it's not meant that way it's just for the elite sages it wouldn't be understood necessarily as a divine law it would be understood as the Tao of heaven but you can see how those two ideas could easily morph from one into the other. The Tao of Heaven is more a discussion that somebody could understand as this is just natural law. This is the way the universe operates. But then you bring that to a general population who are used to divinity worship, used to prayer, and you can simply say it's the will of God. And it communicates the same sort of idea that these are forces beyond your hands that simply will occur. Um, but I think it's that idea, the Tao of heaven, where they had the ability to make that sort of easy commute over to say will of God from Tao of heaven, even though as we've discussed on multiple times, heaven 
doesn't mean the same thing in traditional Chinese that it does within a monotheistic sort of religious connotation. Um, but yeah, that, that would be one of the reasons I could see that translation being turned that way. Um, not necessarily trying to smuggle in an additional concept, but to make the concept more accessible to uh, people who weren't necessarily going to be a scholarly class. Thank you for that. Yeah, because actually, it's interesting. And interestingly enough, the things that one of the things that I have in my notes uh, is how heaven is regarded as a ruling force for the world. Uh, and I do have a note uh, as also as how it's related to just as an asterisk to natural law and that was one thing that had come up for me when i was reading this particular passage um i see kevin actually has typed a explanation point in the chat and then uh followed by unless oh i'm sorry i uh <laughs> uh i'm uh, i have evanique first then kevin uh, then jason Sorry about that, Kevin. Sorry about that, Evanique. No worries. Um, so I have a question about 73, and it's the last part where it says God's, well, my translation says God's nuts are vast and they're mesh wide, but they lose nothing. I'm like, what does, I guess my question is, what does that really mean? Like, it just almost seems like, I guess, we have people come to God, but like, it seems like that last part just doesn't fit. Those last three lines, God's nets are vast and they're mesh wide, but they lose nothing. I don't know, just, it's not clicking for me how it fits and with the rest of the passage. Uh, Amon, would you? This could be because of my insomnia that I just can't stop talking or I'm really losing my bona fides as a Taoist. Um, but I think the idea actually works if you think of it metaphorically and put yourself in the context of being caught in a net. What does that look like? Well, for fish or for anything else, they see what they're trapped in. They're, they're surrounded by it. They're enmeshed by it. They, they are struggling to get out of some, uh, something they're captured in that they can see. But if the mesh is wide, if it's truly wide, we think of things slipping through the net and it explicitly says that is not the case here. So it's not to make it easy to slip through, but it is to make it virtually invisible to be enmeshed in. You don't see the, the loom that you're trapped in. The mesh is too wide. It looks just like it's completely, you know, a window frame, if you will, of perception, but it, doesn't allow anything to slip through that's what it's saying explicitly so you don't necessarily see the pattern in which you are trapped but you are still trapped in this pattern because everyone is trapped in this pattern sorry i was on mute uh thank you Amon. uh next up i have kevin Thank you, Joe. My God. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure this is my God, how to speak to you, or religion people, non-religion people. Mm -hmm. This is big in culture. In, initially, though, that's the top world. One of the top worlds you need to understand the uh, language, culture. You could understand from a Chinese, uh, my view of Chinese way, uh, nature law, naturalism aspect we got to use we believe as as chinese tradition sky that's direct that's the direct translation sky if you translate to heaven that's a totally you know the change the uh tune of meaning that's a, that's a, that's everything I, I try not to you use that uh previously you know the time time being i used the sky always and here's got a three sky uh, sky not not like sky tie do sky do do of sky another one is a, a, a net of sky sky net or 
she always speak if this is if you speak to Chinese, it's no uh, uh, language barrier. In modern days, slightly different, still understandable. However, when you we use, for example, Western like uh, North America, we Christianity is dominated culture, we easily slip away original. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Actually, yeah, that translation would actually change it for me as well. Uh, if we change heaven into sky. Um, yeah, Jason, do you have more, any? Yeah, one more thing. So we, you know, like traditionally, from my since I growing up, we believe something's just uh, like a deity. Put it that way, mutual deity. You can consider as God or multiple God, or something's just. Uh, uh, higher than a human being understand a mind and um, higher than a technology ai everything else so far in uh, uh, human history thank you thank you kevin actually uh jason since your uh, your explanation point is actually next anyway uh would you like to comment on that yeah i and think the um uh, i think that we are in the last saturday's uh, uh asian philosophy Meet up. You know, some of you are here. We we talk about this. Uh, actually, translated as a heaven, in a way, it's uh, misleading. Kevin is totally right. But translated to sky also have another misleading on that because uh, sky is too physical, and the heaven is too religious, uh, too Christian -like, like. So last Saturday, have an example. Usually, the emperor being called the son of the heaven. So one person will regard the oh, son of uh, heaven, that must be Jesus. So that's totally wrong, right? So basically sky and, and uh, heaven, uh, I think both are wrong, technically speaking. So I almost want to change them to Tian, just you know, make it as, you know, that's, that's sky is too physical and heaven is too religious. So it must be in between. So I think that's probably the right way. And anybody have a good words, okay? And I, I will happy to take it. I think that that's the thing, you know, when I feel most translation, translate as a heaven, and then I just follow it without thinking too much. So I think that's one thing uh, it's uh, important. And then, uh, okay, I, th I think I will stop here and I have other things I talk later, yeah. Can I, I, can I just ask a quick follow-up to that is that, um, what do you mean by too physical? Could you? Okay, so sky, basically we talk about the real sky, right? Uh, right. Something over there, right? We don't, when in English, when, they say, when we say sky, we just means the thing, the material thing, the, 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 the something up doesn't have, but they have the, we don't have the somebody called sun of the sky. That would sound very strange, right? Or you say they have the command from sky. That would be very strange, other than thunder, and there's nothing else. So probably Zeus is another way to translate, if you okay. call it uh, Zeus. Probably that's that's the one, you know, but Zeus is too human, okay? They, uh, they, they, they too physical. You can see the guy, okay, the god as Zeus. But if you think of something, you know, uh, there's no shape and powerful, uh, jud judgmental, Okay, something like this, then, but not God. Okay, so that could be the good words, but I just cannot find the right word. So probably the right thing is put the Tian, okay, just translate the sun and just like the Tao, you know, to avoid any kind of uh, misunderstanding. Yeah. Well, this is an opportunity for everyone here to contribute to Jason's translation. Uh, so, um, and come up with a, a different word. So, all right, I have quite a few people in the queue here. Um, and so I'm gonna just go to JP, who's been waiting so uh, patiently, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. JP. Good evening. Good evening. Sometimes with essays, logical arguments, poetry, it's good to start at the back and then go back forward. I like that Ebony question, the last line, because I think that's what this is leading to. There's this net 
whether it's celestial, maybe it's fate, but this net is not going to lose anything. Overall, in life, nothing is really lost. Energy and matter are still self-contained. And the beginning question about whether or not to kill or to let live, are we really making that question? Like in the back of a defeat, if I can even say it right, I get it wrong. The question as to doing what we need to do. Again, the last line almost says to me, it's making that decision. It's holding everything no matter what we do. And in the middle of it where it talks about things are going to flow their way no matter what, no matter what we ask, no matter what plans we make. And again, in the end, dying or not dying, killing or not killing, everything is still going to have its place held within that net. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Always appreciate your comments. Uh, next up, we have, uh, so I'm going to go to people that haven't commented yet. Uh, so I will go to Laura next, then uh, followed by David, then Kevin, then Madeline. Me? Yes. I Laura. think I'm going to go to the trivial. I think if you simply remove the word but before nothing, it makes it all okay. Um, which in, version are you reading? Uh, oh, just, I'm in dire. Oh, you're in the dire version. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. So, would you Would you like to read that uh, version yeah, so read so that people the whole, are, thing? the whole thing? You want me to read? Okay. Uh, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and read the whole thing so that we're aware of uh, what you're exactly speaking about? Old action against others leads to death. Old action and harmony with doubt, doubt leads to life, but of these things sometimes benefit and sometimes injure. But is heaven's way to conquer without striving? It does not speak, yet it is answered. It does not ask, yet it is supplied with all that is that it needs. It does not hurry, yet it completes everything on time. The net of heaven catches all. The mesh is coarse, but nothing slips through. So I was just thinking that if you took out the word but and just said it's mesh is coarse, nothing slips through. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, I, I, that's an interesting uh, perspective. Thank you. Um, would you like to expand on that or? No, just for me, when, when people were talking about, you know, the nature of the net and how it is and, you know, the inability to sort of get through no matter how hard you fight and so forth. And it's just and to say, but nothing slips through doesn't make sense to me. It's a mess of course. And, and you're already saying the net of heaven is, catches all. It's net is coarse. You're saying that heaven has an, a, a mesh net that is coarse and catches everything. And so certainly if it catches everything, it goes without saying that nothing slips through. Okay. Um, yeah, so mine has something sim a little bit differently. Uh, you know, the Ursula Le Guin version is yet nothing, yet misses nothing. So um, thank you for your comments. Laura, follow. Uh, next up, we're going to go with David. Yeah, we're actually having a conversation in the chat about this exactly. And it would be like I was thinking of the word exactly that JP mentioned this thing, which is celestial. And I think celestial might be a more neutral term than than heaven or sky. Because I mean I agree that that I mean in Judaism is a little bit different. Judaism, I heaven doesn't quite have that um uh aspirational sense to it i mean these there's this whole i mean it's these god's army celestial i mean in, in heaven but that's you know and, and uh, you know the lord of hosts and these sorts of things um but but I definitely christianity has has this heaven uh in a in in this 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 purity it definitely has a different different context there and i understand sky so i think it's celestial which is a more astronomical term but related to less i mean it's it's physical but it's also uh somewhat um neutrally spiritual that that they're when coming from sort of the entire universe so that might be um a, a 
a, a term that better maps onto this Chinese concept, um, of, or I mean, celestial sphere, celestial realm, um, you know, some something related to celestial bodies that you, especially talking about again the the empress of coming from this, uh, you know, being being brought to, or, or appointed or anointed through this this divine but not you know godlike. I mean that the, the the universe, the celestial sphere is is has brought forth the the emperor that that probably in english the not perfect but the closest word that i can think of sorry your, about yeah. That. yeah sorry about that um Amon, do you have a response to that actually uh i know that kevin and madeline are next but if you have I didn't want to jump the line. I did want to say I've been tracking the conversation. I think there's some great suggestions, but I think it's almost inescapable. Like somebody pointed out in English, heaven comes with context. It's just too admired in that sort of um, appropriation of right. monotheism. But I do think... Um, Matt, Madeline made the offer of the heavens, which is old fashioned, but I do think it kind of denudes that sort of singular monotheistic pearly gate envisionment. And it does sort of capture the idea that David was alluding to, which is this isn't just about, and Jason was talking about the sky as a physical thing, and this has a a connotation of more than physical. It's more the order you would see in nature when you were to look up on a clear night watching the celestial dance above your head and how it appears to be so orderly, so repetitious, so consistent, so predictable. That sort of order, which was observable, but not necessarily physical, alone or just physical is the same sort of order from which the son of heaven derives his mandate mandate and from what i do think why tian can still now be used to translate as sky or tian qi you can talk about the weather um because you can talk about some of the physical manifestations of that order or of that unfolding but it is one step removed about process as much as it is about manifestation so it's not a moral order in a way is it there is a moral element to it though the order itself may not be the idea of like the mandate of heaven was that you have to be in good moral standing to Correct. retain that mandate and this is not so much only if we mean in terms of moral of the story, the moral of the story that you rush foolheartedly right. into an adventure is that the celestial law will tr prune you from the gene pool. <laughs> right. It gets back to the natural law, kind of how nature works within that within that context. Uh, so, I, yeah, that that actually that's that's an excellent example. Uh, and I and I do I agree with the the heavens. Uh, uh, recommendation as well. I think, I guess that was Madeline in the chat. I wasn't tracking. Um, so uh, next up I have um, Kevin followed by Madeline. Yeah, still allow that word here. Uh, it's basically, if you explain it by the post that I say, it's uh, the person above one line. Is something about another English word is meta. By Greek, it's behind, beyond, or uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, meta, okay. meta data, meta thinking, right? Beyond or after. For if you translate uh, back to meta to Chinese, we call it yue, origin kind. That's basically here is kind of that kind of feeling. It's uh, um, we very close to the city, the English word uh, Celestia, sphere. Yeah, that, that's mm. some we use that way. And another way, why don't we a little bit use the sky? However, 
with some like uh, open-minded, assigning the meaning kind, why it don't have to be physical. The both have a physical and also have some mind in, in, in it. Yeah, that, that's like we so materially, we, that's language, language itself, like a language itself, other than a different language, Chinese, English, also based on human experience and the way of thinking different, to make it different. For example, if we, it, nature is trying to sky, it looks like too, too lean, right? Oh, very, very nice thing about it, think, think about sky like this way, like that's Jason concern, I believe, that's he said all oh, the sky is uh, more like viewable. Um, yeah, however for us, when you look at us, uh, uh, look up, yeah, it is sky. We sky is, we need respect. That's part of nature, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jason, do you have any comments on that? Or I know you have- Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I've been on. thinking about the, uh, oh, sorry, I've been thinking about the, the translation on heaven or Tian, okay. I, I, I kind of seem to probably will keep the heaven for many, many reasons, because most of translators and most of the people will, uh, uh, will use Tian. For example, when we talk about triad, uh, heaven, earth, and the people, the country that's it. So if you call the sky, earth, and the people, that'd be a little bit strange. You talk about celestial, uh, earth, and the people, also strange. So that's no perfect thing. So if that's a mistake, that's a mistake. Let's keep going and uh, we just spend more time to explain. Look guys, there's no perfect uh, solution. Otherwise, we, just like a chi, right? Today we say chi, okay? And probably I would say 75% of people know what I'm talking about. But if you look at the old translation, right? Like uh, in 1950 or before, they don't translate as chi, they translate as like vigor, they talk to us air, okay, energy, you know. So I, I think later on we might change to tian or, you know, they, they go, you know, that, that, that's what I'm thinking, you know. It, either way, it's confusing, but, <laughs> but that's the also be, the beauty of it. It is the beauty. The, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's why I, I find that the translation process is actually just as interesting sometimes as as some of the, the text itself. Um, so next up, we have, uh, let's see here, uh, we have Madeline, um, followed by, I want to say, I'm sorry, there's quite a few comments here. Um, just Madeline, you're next. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is interesting about the translation that, um, you know, we, we don't have a, a contemporary word in English that, that has the connotation that the word the heavens does. In other words, you, you know, you can gaze up at the heavens um, or the heavens opened and the rain came pouring down. Um, it has that sort of dual connotation uh, that we've kind of separated things out at this point very clearly. I liked uh, Evanique's point that she made a while back about sort of what seemed to be a kind of stylistic or conceptual difference between the end of the poem and the rest of it. Yes. And the conversation since then has really completely enriched uh, my understanding of this chapter. At first, I just sort of thought, okay, yeah, good advice. Um, and the end is very beautiful. But now to see, uh, you know, heaven's net as, as the stars in the sky with the vast spaces in between and human beings darting foolishly into what seem to be gaps in the will of the heavens and uh, turned out not to be gaps and also, um, Amon's comment about scale was really uh, quite mind blowing. Thank you, Madeline. Um, excellent. And I agree with uh, the comment 
once uh, Evanique and JP had, uh, you know, mentioned that starting from the, the end of the poem and then kind of working back the, within the context of what we even mean by heaven, actually as, oh, Mon, I'm, I'm talking, and you have your hand up, forgive me. No, you're fine, actually. It gives me time to <clears throat> crank up the brain. Um, I wanted to thank Madeline, but I also wanted to sort of steer if I can. I, I do think what Madeline said at the end about uh, the comments on the end of the chapter. I think, JP, you were very poignant because what you said about um, the power over life and death that's being alluded to here is made explicit in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and these two chapters tie in very together. This is kind of that prelude to who has the right and the authority to make those sort of decisions? And Lao Tzu's argument is basically that the Tao makes those decisions every day, and it is an inherent natural consequence of the duh of the people, of the actors within its net. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that I do think that um, I didn't want that to get lost in too much of the syntactical discussion about exactly how to translate Qian into English, because yeah, like Jason said, there is no perfect, but I like what he put in the comments about, we understand Xin as heart mind, almost a compound word. And maybe someday we can get to where we understand Qian as heaven sky or celestial heavens, but so, some sort of compound that captures all the idea. Thank you for those comments. And actually, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate uh, uh, how that your the relationship um, in JP's comments, as you had already mentioned, how they relate uh, within this idea who feels like they have the authority to exact the judgment when nature exacts its own judgment on a daily basis. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that. Jason, you have a comment as well. Yeah, I think it's the, that's the uh, who has authority, right? That's the last stanza, okay? How does the have the, the Tao of heaven or heaven sky, celestial sky, celestial heaven, okay? How does the Tao of uh, uh, heaven become a law? So right. that's a connection between the Taoism and the legalism here. So it really depends on who you are talked to, right? Who you are talking to. So right now we read it, we, we assume that's a scene, like Lao Tzu, uh, uh, a wise man, talking to the prince, okay? Then that's one story. But if I'm the prince, right? I listen to this teaching, okay? Talking about the Tao of heaven, the net, the heaven's net is vast, but you know, it don't, you cannot, uh, nothing, uh, uh, can, uh, nothing can go through that, okay? You lose nothing, catch everything. If, I if I'm the prince, I listen to that, then I turn around, talk to my people, talk to my subject. I say, that's a heaven's bus. The heaven's nest is, is, is vast, okay? It catch everything. So be careful, watch your behavior, all okay? right? That's become a law. So really depend who is the speaker, who is this, right? So the you so you can see how does it connect with legalism here. I listen the yeah. teaching, wise man, and then I turn around. I tell my people, say, hey, that's the heaven's law, okay? So I'm going to enforce the heaven's law. So that would be totally change the tone. And in the next chapter, the I think you, you this kind of situation you will see probably even more severe, you know, yes. than, than this one, yeah. Actually, I really like the connection that you made between how the authority and the link between legalism and how things become law. Uh, hopefully, actually, we can cover that a little bit even during your Asian philosophies meetup in three weeks, right, I believe? Yeah, next, uh, this week we will talk about Xunzi, right? And the next right. week, the legal. That, that, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed legalism quite a bit, uh, learning about it. Um, so I had, I think Margarita had her hand up, followed by Madeline. 
Yeah. Um, uh, from my understanding, heavens is so wide, just like this net, it will cover all of us. So even including us will be under the law of heaven, under this net. So maybe before we do things to other people courageously, we need to understand that the same principle, the same law will be applied on us because we are after all under the sky. So maybe that's just one thing because, uh, but I wonder from this chapter, what kind of virtue do that is promoted here, knowing that there is law, heaven's way, or Skyway. Mm -hmm. So how should a learner uh, develop the... Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I was about... Let me share my screen. So I think that's something um, most of people are not focused on this one. Let me show this this one, okay? I think uh, I think the Emmanuel is a question talking about the last stanza. Yes. How does the heavens net connect with others, right? I think if you look at the Chinese here, you look at these four, right? These four, they all start with the same words. That's bu, that means no. So I translate with without. So basics is uh, talking about some negative uh, passive virtue, right? without the vile, speaking, summoning, okay? So you do not doing things, you withhold your behavior, your intention. Same as we talk about yonggan, the valiant enough to dare, and the valiant enough to dare not, okay? So this kind of not doing things is the teaching here. So, and that's how it connects to the net, because you look, look at the net, doesn't matter what kind of net, it's not solid, right? It's not mm -hmm. a close, it's not solid. They have more hole than string. Most of the space are hole, but the net we use to catch, catch the bird, catch the, catch the fish, right? Why they have a lot of big hole over there? But that's talking about the passive, the negative action. I think that's the teaching for the, this, this section. Thank you for that, Jason. Uh, next up is Madeline, followed by Evanik. Mm, yes, what uh, what Jason had been saying just slightly earlier about um, you know the the sage saying all this to the young prince about how how the law of heaven works. For some reason, it put me in mind of a, of how a lobster trap works. Mm. Um, it's a, for those who aren't familiar with it. It's a it's a box uh, of mesh or slats and it has an opening. It has bait inside and has an opening. that's quite wide at the beginning of the opening, sort of like a funnel and the lobster goes in and it can't get out again. Uh, so anyway, I'm sure that that basic design for catching things has been around for a long time. And um, in fact, probably the Chinese invented it first. Um, but it did put me in mind of that. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, that has definitely changed my pers <laughs> yeah, my idea of what the net means. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Uh, Evanique. Just remember how wide that opening looks to the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was excellent. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, Evanique. You're, you're next. Um, and thank you for your comment that got us started. Oh, you're welcome. I just have another question now. Um, so, Jason, when you were talking about uh, that the, the, the holes in the net is the negative, um, the, I guess like the holes in the in the mesh. So is that the negativity slipping out and, and keeping the positivity in? I'm just trying to understand that a little better. I, I think you got the point, right? I think remember in the chapter, early chapter 10 or something, they talk about the 
uh, a cup, you know, because it's empty. Yes. So you can hold it. The window, the room, because it's empty, so you have a function, right? Same thing, same idea here. You know, we all see things, okay, but nothing, okay, is the function there. And then here again, come back, come back again, talk about the net, because it's a lot of big hole on the net, right? But you still can catch everything you want to catch. That's the idea he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Kevin. Got a two or three comments about the scan net. We all let's we are uh, look at a physical net, you know, picture that from sky net, invisible net. If you do something not con convince yourself, doesn't matter who know or not, sky know it. Um, by the way, I don't value those dis discussion about those words. For example, between heaven and sky, that's how experience is different Western and uh, our, our North America here, right? That, that's our mind, basically ex experience different sky we use uh, so lightly in here, but in Chinese, even, you know, I'm not sure it's Asia like that. It's very big, it's big. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your comments, Kevin. Uh, let me see if I have anybody else. I want more, I want. Please. I want to tell you one historical. For example, each uh, uh, dynasty change, Normally, the 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 better, the better side, the how on the xing dou. Basically, I'm aging of sky, like aging of God, aging of Jesus, kind of that kind of you know mode. It help other people's uh, and uh, people to get a better life. Always use this tian dou. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let me see, are there any other comments regarding verse 73? Otherwise, I would like to turn to 74. I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to uh, cut us too short with that. So since we're almost 10 minutes, 12 minutes past the hour. So um, any other comments? Get it moving, Joe. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Our Laura, do you have one last comment? You're muted. You're muted, Laura. Talk. Oh, there, yeah, there you go. I just want to say that um, given that it's it's mesh, those inside can see out. Those inside can see out. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, we will move on to number 73. 74. Or 74, I'm sorry, forgive me. So t please type out explanation point to read your favorite version of verse 74. Uh, we'll start with Penny. Okay. This Followed is by Dave. Gage McDonald again. If you do not fear death, then how can it intimidate you? If you aren't afraid of dying, there is nothing you cannot do. Those who harm others are like inexperienced boys trying to take the place of a great lumberjack, trying to fill his shoes will only get them seriously hurt. Jason, could you take over for a moment? Um, I just need to check on something I may have. Okay, no problem. So who is next? Uh... Ebony, yeah, I was and then David. Okay. And then uh, Margarita. Okay, Ebony, please. Okay, this is from the Tao of Christ, uh, uh, chapter 74. If you do not fear death, no one can intimidate you. 
If you're not afraid of dying, you will not fear living. There will always be people willing to kill for justice, God, or country. But few know the cost of killing. Killing means dying a bit yourself. Oh, a bit oneself, sorry. Weapons always kill the killer. Uh, Brian, please. Okay. Which Brian, did you mean Penny? Oh, yeah, Brian, uh, Brian Nelson. Oh, Penny. <laughs> we already read one, so. Okay, so. Um, I think David. We'll read another one. Next? Otherwise, we we'll go to David. David Edison. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, David, please. Okay, so the thing in English, chapter seventy-four. If men are not afraid to die, it is no avail to threaten them with death. If men live in constant fear of dying, and if breaking the law means that a man will be killed, who will dare to break the law? There is always an official executioner. If you try to take his place, it is like trying to be a master carpenter and cutting wood. If you try to cut wood like a master carpenter, you will only hurt your hand. Thank you, David. Uh, next one would be uh, Margarita. Rick in Bahasa, mm -hmm. thou does not know that sentence. Rakyat tidak takut mati. Mengapa menggunakan hukuman mati untuk menakut-nakuti? Jika membuat orang takut mati dan memandang hukuman mati sebagai celaka, maka siapakah yang berani melanggar hukuman? Hanya ada algojo abadi dari langit yang bertugas melaksanakan hukuman mati. Barang siapa berani mewakili algojo? maka ia bagai tukang kain yang menggunakan kampaknya menebang pohon. Siapa yang mewakili tukang kayu menggunakan kampaknya menebang pohon, jarang yang tidak melukai tangannya sendiri. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brian, yep. Brian, pardon me. Oh, Joe, you're back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, Brian, is it Margarita? I'm sorry, next up in the queue. And then uh, Brian, Brian, and, uh, Brian and Laura. So thank you, Jason. I thought I had it. Okay. I go again with uh, the translation by Yasuhiko Kunura. If the people do not fear death for reasons of extreme poverty or suffering, what is the point of threatening them with death? If the people fear death, and if the outlaws are captured and killed, who will dare to break the law? Yet the act of killing should always be the exclusive province of the great executioner. Therefore, to kill in place of the great executioner is like hewing wood in place of the master carpenter. Few, if ever, will escape cutting their own hands. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next up, we have Laura. Execute. What number, what verse is it? 74. That's what I thought, okay. All right. You just went on mute, Laura. You're on mute. I think it lights me on mute better than on the... <laughs> I'm telling you, these things have a mind of their own, too. Um, if you realize that all things change, there is nothing you will try to hold on to. If you're not afraid of dying, there is nothing you can achieve. There's always the Lord of death. He who takes the place of the Lord of death is like the one who cuts the blade of a master carpenter. Whoever cuts the blade of a master carpenter is sure to cut his own hands. Hmm. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so let me see. Um, does anybody else in the queue? I don't see anyone else in the queue. Uh, we'll go right to Jason's. Uh, I may read the Ursula Le Guin uh, version a little bit later, but I want to make sure that we leave adequate time for comments and everything. 
Okay, uh, this one is uh, the title is the the great executor. Okay, sounds a little bit strange, but that's yeah. the reason. If people no longer fear, I, I, I heard the other translation, but uh, I just have to say some are not uh, loyal to the text because the text, the Chinese word here is sa kir, okay? The talking about the person's job is curing, okay? The position of curing. So that's why um, I translate as uh, the great uh, executor, okay? So if people no longer feel death, how can they be threatened by the punishment of death? If people are meant to constantly feel death and they still act unruly, I can arrest and kill them. And who will dare to act unruly? The great executor is usually in charge of killing. Those who kill for the ex great executor are like whitlers compared to the master carpenter. Those whittlers compared to the great carpenter really don't hurt their own hands. So here the word the great executor or the professional executor, okay? Who is this guy? Okay, so I think that's a big question. So I put the example. It could be really literally means the person whose job is kill the, uh, the, the, the criminal, okay? Or you mean the government, or mean the law, or anybody uh, can kill, or I don't know. But the text used the word sa, that means uh, the guy's job is killing. So I translate as a great executor. So I assume it's heaven. Heaven will kill the bad guy, okay, the guy, the unruly guy. So the prince, you just have to hands off. You don't have to deal, uh, have, uh, touch the blood because if the unruly guy, an unruly, unruly person, will the 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 heaven will punish them. That, that's that's the assumption I I read, but you know. The text doesn't say heaven, just said the great executor. That's it. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Jason. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to hear all the translations. Um, but type exclamation point, go ahead and type exclamation point to now to uh, for your comments on this particular passage. Kevin. Thank you, Joe. I'm there the first one to come with this and the last chapter. Uh, I would relate to those to the war. Uh, last chapter, we talk about the brave, uh, but you know, who going to, if you're too brave, do it sometime without uh, consider con uh, consequence, you're going to die. The one English idiom we code suit yourself in the food mm. so that's something yeah here is the speak if you people don't uh, fear about die why you sweat with die however another they also is cuter who going to cute you, what are you going to have you're going to hurt yourself too thank you thank you kevin yeah. uh, so i have Please, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I think so. The, I think so, uh, who made the comment on that uh, is uh, David. Yeah, I think so probably that's a question, English question. Uh, somebody can help me. It should be what's the difference between exec, uh, executioner and uh, executor? A executor is somebody who is more involved with the law as far as executing some activity. Executioner. Uh, kill, kill, kill the killer is the executioner. So I probably should use be honest, be honor to the to the does, does uh executor has the meaning of killing? No. Or, 
No. Okay. So pop. I mean, it's not. It's not. It's it's it's, it's actually pronounced. I mean, it's, it's normally the the executor, like the executor of a oh, state. Oh. Okay. I mean, so, so it's it's. it's I mean, it's, it's the stress is on a different syllable. It's the executor of the state, like it's it's person who carries out the will and testament who purses, you know, it's a legal status. I mean, it's le legal execution. Okay. And it was an oversight on my part too, because I should have caught that in the edit, but did not. So we should change to uh, execution, right? Yes. Okay, let me change now. Thank you so much. You know, that's a mistake. <laughs> now in my, uh, I'm a little bit, I was a little bit uh, rattled there for a moment. I actually, did not ask him on for his comments. So I apologize and I'm going to go ahead and just defer to him on first. Oh, no, thank you. Um, I, I apologize to Jason first for missing that oversight that that is my mistake for, you know, not being as thorough as I could have been. Um, but yeah, this I think I mentioned to Jason that this to me when I read this chapter I always think of the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland the you know the ruler who goes around willy-nilly screaming off with her head that became you know a hackneyed cliche that nobody even took seriously in Alice in Wonderland it, it was she was a parody of a queen or a ruler and that's what this is warning against is the young princeling coming into power now having the power of life and death over others and who do you think he'll be to just you know use capital punishment at every turn at every little slight at every indignation you do that and not only does that threat lose its appeal but eventually the people stop being afraid of the consequence and simply get sneakier at working behind your back that that's the consequence of you know constantly having this default of the most extreme of punishments um so i do think that this ties in with that chapter 73 about understanding that there is a natural order these fools will get their comeuppance on their own as a result of their own action you do not have to go capture and kill them and that's actually one of the sentences that i think gives some people some consternation is it, that second and third it says if i make people constantly fear death or if people are made to constantly fear death and they still act unruly i can just arrest and kill them and who would dare to act unruly? It's a rhetorical question. It, it's speaking the thoughts of a young ruler. You know, and then the answer is, you know, given in the second part by the example of the great executioner is a master craftsman. This is someone who knows just how much to trim off the log, to, you know, shave off the door, to make it swing and fit perfectly. And you, like a, you know, ham-fisted whittler trying to, you know, build a temple are not going to build anything worth a damn, basically. That, that's kind of the, that's what this passage imparts as the lesson. Leave this to the master. Don't take it upon yourself. Don't act with hubris. It won't do you any good. Thank you, Amon. Um... Excellent comments as always. Next, so let me see. Let's see what the queue is here. Uh, I think Madeline. So, yeah, then Jake. I think, yeah, I think Madeline. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, Madeline, then Jason, then followed by Brian. Actually, uh, Aman just answered my question because I had been wondering about the interpretation of it. Uh, at the beginning, it seems as if. Uh, the thing to do is to keep everyone afraid of death and execution. Uh, but at the end, it seems to be saying, no, no, hands off. Uh, the net of heaven is going to come and get them. So you don't need to worry about it. Yes, actually, and it's amazing that people still just obey the law, despite 
the fact that there is an executioner is so that yes, it, waiting for it to naturally occur would only make logical sense. Uh, so next up, uh, we have uh, Jason followed by Brian or Penny. Uh, yeah, I think this one and the previous one, right? You can just like uh, Madeline talk about like uh, the heaven's net going to catch uh, catch the bad guy, the unruly one, and the the, the heaven as a great uh, executioner will kill or will stop the unruly one. But if you take the point of view of the legalism, right? There will be. Uh, the last one would be uh, the, 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 the heaven's net become the law. And uh, this one would be read as the great exec uh, executioner, right? That's the law. You don't kill people just because the, as a person, you set a law, have the law punish the people, right? So the law become the great executioner. So basics is depend on how you're going to interpret the great uh, executioner or the heaven's net, right? You can consider it's a heaven, the nature law, or you have the draconian law. Okay, that's what you, uh, how, how, depend on how you want to uh, interpret this text. Thank you, Jason. Um, next up, we have, um, so Jason, is it, oh, Penny, then followed by, I'm sorry, followed by Madeline. That's okay. My, mine is actually related to what they've just been talking about, because I was just thinking in my mind, the great executioner, are they really talking about like a person who's an executioner or like the Tao, the, you know, the laws of nature that are going to always, you know, punish the unjust and take care of it. So the ruler should not try to put himself in place of the laws of nature. I was wondering if that interpretation was correct. I, I believe that, yeah, that's, you know, Jason, feel free to, and Armand, feel free to comment, but I do think that that's, yeah, yeah I mean, I think that that's pretty much an accurate depiction of what the, this is saying. I, I would agree that that is what it, is trying to say, but like Jason was saying, there have been plenty who have decided that that meant I should be the hand of nature. And that is not necessarily what the chapter imparts, but it is how it was interpreted by a lot of legalist scholars. Yes, I mean, this idea that people obey laws just because they fear punishment is, doesn't seem to necessarily hold true um all the time or at least not execution anyway the people will still act out anyway um madeline uh this is a question about the historical context of the times that in which this was written uh so there's the death penalty i assume there are also fines uh were there labor camps or prisons i mean did they have prisons back then um or was it either you know death penalty and fines or just you know you walked free so i'm gonna let aman answer madeline's question then jp could you go after that do you mind waiting for a moment thank you, thank you. i can be pretty quick about this um there was capital punishment there were tortures. Um, there wasn't fines unless you were a, a elevated jinshur. If you were a scholarly class, then you were exempt from capital punishment, which was one of the incentives for doing well in the empirical exams. And as far as conscripted labor goes, um, that wasn't punishment. That was just stock and trade everyone I had to laugh when you ask about that as punishment because it wasn't punishment it was simply what was for everyone everyone did their time of conscripted labor under virtually every emperor ever that's how we get a great wall that's how you get the grand canal that's how you get you know the uh 
the uh, terracotta warriors it is by making the people do work. So you could say that they didn't have a concept for slavery, but when everyone is, no one has that concept. Hmm. That's true. Uh, JP, please. Oh. I think it was Jason and somebody else who was referring to the question about law itself because it doesn't to me tell us what law it's talking about. I understand the societal law and the, the idea of being executed for breaking a human law, but maybe it's just the law of life and death. We can ruin our lives being afraid we're going to die, or we can live. And if we're going to live, we should realize there is a master carpenter allow the master carpenter to do the work, Wu Wei. And at some point, the execution is going to come. It's not us. It's not somebody else. It's something else like that net in which we are all enmeshed. Thank you. That's an interesting point. Uh, what law is actually being referred to and this and how we live our lives is a really important point because this idea that if we live in like that we're fearful of death, then it's paralyzing in how we behave in and of itself. Um, so Jason, would you like to comment? I see you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you, JP, for reminding Excellent. By the law, okay. I, when I when we talk this one and the plus, we uh, matter ask about the uh, execution punishment. I, I start to think back. During that time in China, I don't think the concept of law probably very weak. So there's no way, uh, I almost want to say there's no way the original meaning is heaven's net is law. The great exec executioner is the law. Uh, I just don't see this way. The concept of law become clear is to the later part of a warring state in the Qin, uh, state of Qin. Okay, because they start to use legalism. And at that time, you know, the law had the set a clear written law, okay, as a standard become uh, clear. So during the Lao Tzu's time, uh, that assume it's the so-called before warring state, the spring and the autumn period. Uh, during that time, uh, Confucianism teaching would be like for the aristocrat or scholar or so-called the person with education, you don't use punishment. You use so-called the rituals the, to, uh, to, to control the, the people, this kind of people. But for the regular people, you use punishment. So, uh, that, that's a little bit different than uh, today's concept of uh, law, okay? So I think the law and the ritual are blurred during that time. It's not very clear, okay? Uh, what's the law, what's the ritual, okay? I think that's the thing. And just a little bit on uh, Madeline's concept about the punishment. Uh, they do have a lot of punishment. Uh, usually is corporeal uh, uh, punishment, right? They kill you, they torture you, and the common thing is cut off your foot, okay? So like a famous uh, 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 the general, okay, one of the general, Sun Bin, okay, because his foot had been cut off, okay? So, you know, so that's kind of punishment they have. And the labor can, just like a month said, there's no labor can because uh, you are responsible to do the labor for the government during the time. Yeah, thank you. Interesting comment. Uh, I just saw Mon pop up with is the idea that tattooing was also used as a form of punishment. Um, so next up, we have uh, Kevin. Yeah, I would use the, the for your question and others. Uh, it, last chapter, answer these chapters. I would say this is still tear. If you use another, it's uh, tear dog. 
which means uh, do, uh, uh, sky uh, dough, or also in English we can use mandate heaven, right? That's it's a mandate sky. That's we. That's something we don't understand. We as a uh, human, especially these days, AI technology, like we feel we superhero. We control the world. We can control everything, including you know sky and earth, other people, other country, other folks. So we lost ourselves. It's something else about us, meta world. You see. No matter what, we are where we come, where we go. We born, we are going to eventually back to Earth. So, this this kind of nature concept, we not educated. We just since our mature age, like it's how the few group like ourselves, we talk about this in nature, indigenous people, how close we the, their sky, their their God. So. I would say this, this is something we, as our modern way of thinking, we have to find answer by own knowledge. But that's, I would say, con boundary of condition. We need to be reached too far. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Aman, do you wish to respond to that? Um, Followed by Jason. I, I don't know that it's a response to that okay. per se, um, but. I've been thinking about this for a bit and there's actually a pretty good abject example happening in the world currently with the Russia and the Ukraine mm. um, that we can look to, to see some of the lessons that are being imparted here, not just about sort of the universal comeuppance that are implicit in one's actions, though I think we all kind of hope for that to some degree, but there's also something about advocacy, what you try, even if you are not necessarily the emperor who can call for someone's head, you may be a imperial minister in a high position, and you might be in a position to influence that. A couple of days ago, maybe even a week at this point, um, one of our senators was on a Sunday talk show talking about um, the possibility of somebody killing Putin, which I don't think is an unreasonable thought. I think many people have had that thought lately. The problem is speaking it aloud because that little clip went viral within Russian state television as a piece of propaganda to support the idea that, mm. look, see, we really are at war with the West. So a lesson in this chapter, not just of taking on the mantle of the great executioner, but even being sort of the cheerleader for the great executioner, that those actions can backfire in a big way. It is much better to, well, like the previous chapter said, the Tao, without speaking, excels at responding. And that is a lesson that is really valuable and poignant in the modern world. Um, so that was just what I was thinking about as we were discussing this, that it, the implications of this are not just acting by one's own hand it's also action within one's own the and one's own speech and one's own uh determinations and one's own advocacy that's an you know it's it's an interesting thing too there's a long history of assassinations themselves uh as actually kind of backfiring um in general that people there's something much worse behind what is actually already there sometimes and yep, to just, think of yeah i'm sorry go just ahead. ask alexei navalny sometimes assassinations backfire and they sow the seeds of imperial descent that's right that's right so it, it really is an interesting uh uh current day example that you had 
that you just brought up and then yes that they these things do tend to backfire when we take them upon ourselves um no matter what the uh situation may be no matter how justified we may feel uh the individual has it coming to them um jason yeah i just want to have a uh uh, explanation on the great uh, executioner. Okay, so I just called uh, this one from two uh, great uh, uh, interpret interpreter or commentator on the Tao Te Ching. One is Wang Bi. Okay, so it's on the third century. Uh, he talked about the uh, <clears throat> the great executioner uh, because for the unruly guy, the unruly person, the person behaved wrongly. Uh, people will hate him and then so will be abandoned by the society. So, you know, so that's what he meant, great uh, execution. And another uh, commentator is Su, Su, Su Ce, okay, who is a uh, live about 10th century uh, Song Dynasty. And he talked about the, uh, if you behave your weird or unruly, basically the heaven, will abandon you. So they act as great executioner. So I think that's two commentators you know, in the history talk up, uh, <clears throat> commentate on this, uh, the great uh, executioner. Thank you, Jason. Um, if it's all right with everyone, then I actually am gonna go ahead and uh, read the Ursula Le Guin version since uh, I don't see anybody's hands up. Uh, at the moment, um, it's titled The Lord of Slaughter. When normal, decent people don't fear death. How can you use death to frighten them? Even when they have a normal fear of death, who of us dare take and kill the one who doesn't? When people are normal and decent and death fearing, there's always an executioner. To take the place of that executioner is to take the place of a great carpenter. People who cut the great carpenter's wood seldom get off with their hands unhurt. So this idea that we're harming ourselves in the process is actually kind of highlighted in the final, um, in the final couple of lines, which is actually something I like. She also has a comment here. Uh, to Lao Tzu, not to fear dying and not to fear killing are equally unnatural and antisocial. Who are we to forestall the judgment of heaven or nature to usurp the role of, exec of the executioner? The Lord of Slaughter is Whaley's, Whaley's great grand translation. Uh, so I see we have, since then, we have, uh, next up, we have Madeline. Yeah. I raised my hands previously. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so Margarita followed by Madeline, then Laura. Yes, thank you. Um, I remember in earlier chapter, we have 67. I think it is quite interesting because heaven in 67, if one to save someone, it will use love or some kind of positive energy like the three jewels thing. And uh, yeah, but here, Heaven can also uh, be the, the, the source of endings one life. So um, for me, it's quite interesting how this heaven's way can work that can save and also can giving the natural death. And yeah, I wonder maybe Jason and Amon can explain the relationship why heaven and how, sh how what heaven can can function like this and how should a leader understand heaven or, and what kind of decision it will make for, for, uh, for this. And in addition to that, I think it's quite unique that they, uh, this, in this chapter, they talk about death because that is something natural. So why would people would impose such unnatural death by execution? And, and how should Tao, Taoist or learner, uh, see death, a natural death in this sense. Thank you. Um, Jason and Aman, or either or. Um, this will feel a little all over the world, but 
I'll try and make this make some sense. One contextual thing that's worth knowing about ancient China is the absolute supreme importance, paramount concern with the controls of water in the environment that the Yellow River Basin flooded sometimes horrifically and those flooding could do a great deal of damage, kill a number of people, but they also laid the silt that allowed for agriculture to thrive in that region. So being able to have good controls over water management was actually a major task of most empires throughout most of imperial Chinese history. If you take that as sort of a suppositional architecture and then think about heaven's ability to either reward or kill, you could see where a gentle rain could be construed as, hey, this is a great thing. Our crops are getting watered. We're getting you know, what we need. We have some fresh water, wonderful, wonderful. But then the river starts flooding again. And now it's going to wash out all the people who were thoughtless about where they built their homes or how they wanted to have a pond in front of their house. So they you know, diverted the river. So in a lack of forethought, a lack of caution, a lack, a lack of pre-planning was almost a recipe for one's own demise in that time because of the natural environment in which they were surrounded. Whereas good forethought and good planning could also be the recipe for thriving, having bumper crops, actually having a people who were going to not just weather the flood season, but really do well, um, generally. And there is something to the idea in the mandate of heaven almost of how the behavior of a leader could make a difference if a if an emperor was so consumed with themselves and didn't want to do sort of the basic infrastructure work of like say dredging the canals they became more prone to flood they became more prone to disaster those people could suffer by their actions and the people could get upset about this and that leads to a revolt that leads so there is actually almost a physical way of understanding how they had a feedback mechanism within their environment to see these things happen to them in real time, in real life. That metaphor of both the nurturing and destructive power of water extends well and is throughout the Tao Te Ching when it says water is the closest to understanding the Tao. And this is one more aspect of it, probably its most mm. seminal aspect, aspect as both nurture and executioner and it really depends on your approach to it that makes the difference of how it would affect you it's interesting because i just uh, attended a discussion uh just on this very topic and how geography actually shapes nations in general uh so and china was covered in how its water management would actually dictated how the the future of the country jason did you want to respond uh as well and yeah i think Zaman said that, yeah that, that that's right the water is important and the common thing is you can think about the uh if you compare china with uh, at the same time in the greek right that's a totally different situation because chinese they really need a government to manage a large government to the city state is not going to work because the common situation, just like Aman said, the water is so important because it's agricultural. So when you show the water, you block the river, you can hold the water, but the country live downstream, they short of water. But if it's too much water, you start to drain the water to your neighboring country, then your neighboring country is in flood, is in trouble. So basics, the water, the Yellow River basics has force Chinese people to form a large government. The ideal situation, democratic uh, city-state is impossible in, in China uh, during that time. And again, back to uh, whose question? 
question is a uh, Margaret Tart's question about the curing, the nature of this one. Uh, I have no answer on this one because this chapter is a little bit hard to me. You know, it's it, it doesn't not fit to the whole philosophy very well, at, at least in my opinion. So uh, that's the only thing I can say. You know. I will say to that though, Jason, that if you think of these lessons as tracking a princeling through their aging, there were a few chapters back where you could actually read in the chapter, it was all allusions to, you know, one state wanting to conquer another. And there was a lot of sort of sexual innuendo. And if you think about, you know, a young man entering puberty, he's speaking to him in that time. We're later in the chapters that young man is now a young adult taking on the mantles of power and authority and very possibly drunk on their own power. You want to start making lessons that are more about clipping that back, about not simply, yeah, so you grew up, you're 17 years old, you're the prince of this state of way. And yeah, you could go and kill that entire, you know, band of coolie laborers of 50 people just to prove how powerful you are, but it's really, really a counterproductive action. So the lessons start to sort of pace the maturing of the audience as you go through. Thank you, Amang. I, I never thought about this, but that's an interesting way to think it. Because it's a, you basically you talk about from chapter one to 81, it's a chronicle order. Okay, from the very beginning and through, let's say, 15 years lesson, right? Yeah. So the, the guy is, uh, uh, when he was 15, listen to the Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chang Dao, right? And mm. then to the very last chapter, 81, the, the young prince already uh, at the age of 35, okay? So the, the last one talking about the not violent. Right, non right. Non right. So that, that fit the idea, you know, for, uh, you know, even there's no, I believe there's no historical uh, uh, evidence to show that, but that's the interesting way to, interesting way to read it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Think of it as an early Harry Potter. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, so we have Laura um, followed by uh, Kevin. Okay, um, I was wondering here, what happens to the women? Do they ever fall under the same things as the men in terms of being like you die because their women are saved from that? Um, and if women are saved from that, do they take over the mantle of their husband? Do they begin to take a role in society different? Um, and then the third thing is, um, are there, you know, have there be, begun law and, you know, in these countries so that somebody who says, you know, you die, somebody can say, no, you know, you made a mistake and contest anything and fight it in any way. Uh, maybe later on in time, you know, when the guy's around 35 or people beginning to say, I contest this, I, you know, I want to go to court. I'm not ready to die kind of thing. So was there any due process, uh, Jason? So, so um, Jason, I'm, on, I, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with those times to, to make, to answer that. Uh, I, I didn't get the question. Can, um... I Did... think Laura's question was due process for women in ancient China. How did they fare? at the expense of their husband's foolhardiness or good decision making and my answer is really one word poorly <laughs> I, I i have okay so this question i have my own opinion on that because during that time the woman is not being treated very that bad okay as later near confucius time mm. uh, so i can give you a story about uh, uh, how to call it the the uh, the mother of a uh, king okay so okay chinese the deck of for sure deck of the uh, females right women's right but the mother's right is strong okay so 
Uh, so in this way, mother has a strong power, has a lot of power. So the uh, king's mother, uh, a lot of time they hold the power. That's true. And then it's not that conservative. One story, okay, I like this story is in Qin Dynasty, the mother of Qin, okay, of uh, emperor, okay, received the uh, diplomat, okay, from other country. So he talked about, she talked about story. She said, when my husband used to alive, right, and we sleep together, she, sometimes he put one deck on top of me. I feel very heavy, but when he put whole body on top of me, I feel happy, not heavy. <laughs> Why? Because I enjoy it, so I don't feel the weight. Okay, so that's the example. Like that. So you can see at that time the conversation is quite open. Okay, so why everybody crying? So okay. so this is. <laughs> So you can see during that time, uh, uh, conversation is not that conservative as you and uh, most of people thought. So there's a lot of story, a lot of conversation is interesting. But of course, woman is not in the same level as men in this uh, I don't think I mentioned about women, but mentioned about sex, about the male, female uh, inter sexual intercourse. That's true. But, you know, and then Dao De Jin also has been like a lot of things like behave like a woman, right? Receive it, right? That's the kind of thing they are thinking about. But at that time, I think it's quite open compared to most of people, even like 200 years ago, probably even open more uh, fail than 200 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, thank you. So I think we have Madeline, uh, then Kevin. If I got that order correct. Yes. Um, let's see. Well, what Iman was saying about uh, the politician uh, who thought assassinating Putin would be a good idea. I thought, you know, it seems like that's the sort of thing that someone would think on a personal level. And he was probably thrilled that he had an audience, but again, sort of as a person. Um, that he wasn't thinking through <clears throat> the effects of his office, of someone in his office saying that. And I thought, wow, that is really kind of a Confucianist thought on my part, uh, that he was not comporting himself in a way that befit his position. You know, he wasn't thinking through the consequences. So that was kind of a stray thought. Uh, my main thought was I was thinking about the endings of the two chapters we discussed this evening. Uh, there's the net and uh, the carpentry. Uh, there's certainly in Shakespeare, there's a fair amount of carpentry images that also is about um, the cosmos and justice and fate, especially fate. Um, and how the, the images at the ends of these two chapters are about, are about things that have been made, uh, made things by humans nets, things by carpenters, uh, they're not, so these things that are being done, uh, heaven is casting a net or there's the great executioner, uh, neither one is something that would occur in nature. Both of them are things that are made by people. And so maybe heaven or the heavens are uh, using human-like things to deal with human beings, or maybe, um, I don't know why, I'm, I, I mean, surely there must be some imagery for natural justice that doesn't involve uh, artifice, but I'm not sure what that would be. I'm not sure either. Jason, do you have anything? No. <laughs> no. Sorry, Madeline. Uh, I'm out of answers. Um, now we end. What's that? It's a good way to come to a finish. Oh, no, we have Kevin next. Oh. But. Kevin. You, you want to me? See? Uh, yeah. 
Kevin, yeah, yeah you, okay. you had an explanation uh, after that. I believe after Madeline. Were you after Madeline or no? I'm sorry, there are so many comments on these. Uh, no, actually, you weren't. Um, so do you have any comments or no? Yeah, initially, I forgot about initially, but I agree with Jason's observation about the Aurora question about a woman. One idiom called Mu Yi Tie Xia. A mother is uh, to speak in Chinese tra traditional uh, education. Uh, mm -hmm. We lost it there. Meng Mu Sai Chie. Basically, you know, it's, it's from, a, yeah, it, it's uh, that time. Um, it is that you see the why called a hundred school if everybody is open, and the one strange thing, however, uh, percentage wise, why still mostly for example, uh, the teacher still mostly the man. That's a mystery for me. Yeah, I curious too. Um, yeah. That's it for now. I forgot my initial thought about it. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, Jason, do you have any uh, comments or any closing comments? Uh, no, I, I think I, 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 I try to answer my, Madeline's question. You know, like, Madeline, can you, can you, can you uh, 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 brief your question again? Because I did not get it what exactly you, you want to know. Um, I'm not sure it's a question that has an answer okay. uh, or has only one answer, but that um, at the ends of both chapters, uh, justice of heaven is done um, using imagery of things that people make, nets or carpentry, oh. or, uh, or be it the, whatever the tools would be of an executioner, um, rather than imagery that would take place um, so sort of at, at, at one remove from it all. In other words, there's heaven, there are people, and then there are things people make uh, rather than just things that might occur in nature. Uh, like say, um, like we might use a metaphor like water seeks its own level or something like that. Yeah, okay, yeah. That, that, thank you, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, 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 that that's a great, great observation. So, um, I think uh, Dao De Jing specifically, they use the example of very common thing, right? Cup, window, net, carpenter, you know, all these kind of things to explain the high, very high philosophical question, metaphysical question, Dao, political, you know, they always use something at hand to uh, as an example to explain. I think if we compare to other uh, uh, philosophical uh, writing during that time, Confucius, Anilak, or Moism, whatever, I think Lao, uh, Dao De Jing is very down to the earth, talk about very general thing, window, cup, uh, wheel, you know, there's many, many things like this. And uh, Zhuangzi later time, they talk about strange story, right? Mm. Uh, legendary story, but, but Lao Zi, Dao De Jing, hardly call uh, like the ancient king doing something. They didn't say that, only said something very common thing you can see around the world. I think that's a very, uh, one of the very special. I didn't pay much attention on that until Madeline mentioned this one. I, I think that's a great observation. Thank you, Jason. Um, I don't see any other comments. Yeah, in the chat. I, I, I remind me. I no, please go ahead. Would yeah. yeah. For me, I would say there is a word sound. I think our, our, our sound, our mind need open and this little bit switch, open minded. For example, the, uh, what's the definition for the philosophy? Normally, the words of a meaning we base in English interpret this. So, why not though? Is a, why philosophy has to be scientific or rational always. So that's another way. From we see, let's go into hard to understand. From we see the sky, dough, chi. It's a, another real example. For example, our phone, smartphone. We got iPhone. We all got an Android phone. 
It looks all oh, like a phone, but in, inside you talk, talk detail is different. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and thank you, Madeline, for your for your comments. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so I will just end it with uh, doing some upcoming announcements for this week. Uh, we have tomorrow evening, uh, we have Comprehensivist Wednesdays, and it's music, a polymathic gold mine. Uh, and that's in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. And we will be covering the Bhagavad Gita on Thursday and Friday instead of Saturday and, and instead of Friday and Saturday. So uh, that has now just been posted. And this Saturday, we will be covering uh, with the Asian Philosophies Group, uh, Hansu. Am I saying that correctly, Jason? Uh, Han, Han, Xu, okay. We call it a, a realistic uh, wing of confusion. Yes. Yeah. Versus Mencius is idealistic, right? So that's a two different view to look at the Confucius and uh, teach. So I would actually, uh, and then let me see, on Sunday, we will uh, be uh, continuing our series with Mark Stallman on digital Catholic social teaching, teaching, which has actually been a really fantastic series. Uh, so I encourage everyone to attend that if possible. Um, it has a lot of deep philosophical concepts uh, that it's related to Catholicism, but it also gets into the how we relate to the uh, faith to the digital world. Um, and uh, there is a special event Sunday evening at 9 p.m., and that is the virtue of courage that we'll be covering which is something we touched on this evening with verse 72. Uh, so that is what is coming up in the next few days. Uh, check the website, of course, as always. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us this, here this evening. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Joe, for hosting. Yes, thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jason. See you next week. See you next week. I'll see you Saturday. So there's nothing Saturday afternoon, Joe? Uh, there is the Fountainhead uh, on Saturday afternoon. Thanks. So, yes. Okay. No Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Good job. Thank you. As always. Thanks.